uncertain normal. Neighbors have gifts and are assets in their communities. People, places, and spaces are assets. As an organization, INRC has been working remotely, but they're still actively engaged with how neighbors are supporting each other and where neighbors need help. We have also had to bend and change shape to make sure we're supporting our communities from our creative placemaking program and other community workshops to our public allies program and other initiatives. We've continuously created ways to make sure we're meeting community members where they need us. We know that there are many neighborhoods that are suffering. It's in those situations that we've seen neighbor, many neighbor-led initiatives working together to support their communities, community members who recognize they were assets and created ways to sustain their community. Now, how do we keep this going and spread efforts to other communities and neighborhoods? How can we maintain these efforts in our communities while remembering what we've collectively endured to get to this point. Every day, people are the ones who set the standard for how we sustain the magic that's been created thus far. This includes artists, creators, neighbors, and other community members who continue to plan and keep indie flowing. I'm thankful to be part of a city that's constantly growing and changing shape, especially because it comes from the work of many many amazing community members working to create more sustainable communities in Indianapolis. This evening, we'll hear about efforts of neighbors across the city. Through our community leader and keynote speaker, we will learn about efforts to support our neighborhoods. Our 16th annual Collaborative Spirit Award honors a group of neighbors that came together, created a sense of place, and built an even stronger sense of community and community pride. In order to remain resilient, INRC has undertaken some exciting initiatives that we will share a bit about, as well as our vision for our organization and in these neighborhoods. And to get things started, I'd like to introduce Gina Lewis Alexander, who will talk about INRC's efforts to remain financially resilient and sustainable. Good evening, everyone. It is such a pleasure to see all of your faces after we've been through such a interesting 18 months of COVID and pandemic, I'm glad that INRC has the opportunity to present to you our uh, information. I am the INRC Vice President of the Board, as well as a member of our INRC Finance Committee. And so I'm pleased to share with you a brief report on INRC's finances and our financial position as we move forward to the new year. Just a few highlights for you. I want you to know that we are glad to um, have our 16th year in a row that we have had a clean audited financial statements. And I think that speaks volumes to the staff and to the operations committee on how we expedite and make sure that we do clean business and are always on top of our financial um, situations. You will see in a breakdown of our 2020 budget, the functional expenses. Administration is at a 9%. Community building is at 18%. Our training um, center is at 8%. Our fundraising is 2%. And our biggest expense is also serving the community through the public allies uh, program. In 2020, you will see a breakdown of this budget and how we have tried to maintain what is the priorities of the organization. We um, also are having a generous community supported INRC with over $890,000 in support. And for that generous community support, we would like to say thank you. We are continually working to diversify our funding. And in 2020 and 2021, we have partnered with new stakeholders on strategic initiatives, as well as for general support of our work. And so a goal of INRC's strategic plan is to diversify our funding. 
And this year we've increased our project income by nearly 200% and increased our donations by 29%. And I think that is very commendable. So in saying thank you, I would like to share our major partners and supporters during 2020 and 2021, the Central Indiana Community Foundation, Lilly Endowment, the Corporation for National and Community Service, AmeriCorps Serves Indiana, our public allies, the City of Indianapolis, Department of Metropolitan Development, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We also like to thank the National Bank of Indianapolis for their continuous support of INRC and our annual meeting and their support. Everybody joining us this evening can help us achieve our goals of supporting strong neighborhoods. And please consider making a donation of any amount to INRC in support of our work with neighborhoods and partners across the city. And as a bonus, if you make a gift of $100 or more, it is eligible for our Neighborhood Assistance Program, NAP, tax credits, and it supports our Indianapolis Community Building Institute, the ICBI. Please reach out to us if you'd like to learn more about NAP and how our NAP credits can benefit you. And you can also go online to donate.inrc.org. So again, we look forward to serving you, the community of Indianapolis and in all of its neighborhoods and neighbors and we appreciate your support this year and we look forward to serving you again. Thank you so much for your donation and giving me the opportunity to present our financial status to you. Good evening, thank you, Gina. Um, Gina has been on INRC's board for a few years but has been a community partner for over two decades and thank you so much for your support and partnership. My name is Anne Marie Taylor and I am the INRC Executive Director. Um, I would like to say again, thank you so much for joining us this evening and welcome. I am excited to share with you a few highlights of 2020 and 2021. Um, for all of us, as you know, these past 20 months have been incredibly busy for INRC as we wrapped up our strategic planning process that you'll hear a little bit about later and we set INRC's vision for the next three years. In 2020, our partnering organizations and neighbors faced immense challenges. INRC did our very best to step up and pivot to best support our neighbors and our neighborhoods. INRC staff launched into action, moving programming virtually, reaching out to partners and neighbors to ensure all were connected and supported and to learn about the amazing things happening. As a result, we transformed our work with neighborhoods. A few of the highlights are Indianapolis Community Building Institute, our leadership community development curriculum, graduated 20 neighbors representing seven neighborhoods across the city. We offered our 10th annual Neighbor Power Indie Gathering last earlier this year, excuse me, March, um, all virtual with over 300 participants. And we honored eight great triarchs who are longtime leaders who have shaped our neighborhoods and our city and have set an example for us for grassroots leadership and advocacy. The great, great triarchs was borrowed from our friends at the Harrison Center, who, who is our partner in our creative placemaking program. Right now we're working with over 10 neighborhoods across the city as they plan and implement community-led projects in their own neighborhoods. In 2020 and 2021, we also celebrated the graduation of our 11th and 12th classes of AmeriCorps Public Allies Indianapolis. We welcomed our 13th class last in September. It is, a, it is November already. Um, we celebrated the graduation of 37 graduates who served at 31 neighborhood-based organizations and government agencies and partnered on six neighborhood projects with community leaders. 
We also partnered with several neighborhood-based organizations to support their work and provide community development programming. Some examples include our, our partnership and, with the Alliance for Northeast Unification and Community Alliance of the Far East Side. We worked with neighbors and partners to design a customized community building institute program in and with the community members. We provided training with the American Red Cross Indiana region to all of their staff and program participants. We partnered with the local initiative support corporation as they kicked off their very exciting healthy food access initiative. Partnering with Inglewood Christian Church on their cultivating communities project as they work with houses of worship across the community and brainstorm and provide support on ways to best connect with the neighbors in which their houses of worship are located. We've worked with several neighborhood organizations, including the Kennedy King Neighborhood Association and Arlington Woods. And we are very grateful for the work of all of our neighbors and partners across, across the city. INRC's, INRC's team of staff members have done incredible work, always do, but especially in these last 18 months plus during COVID, shaping and working to shape and refine the programming to ensure that we remain relevant and responsive. I wanna be sure to recognize the, the INRC team. You met Ari Beatty earlier this evening, our neighborhood engagement director. Sharon Logan is our neighborhood training director. Olga Mogion is our program associate and also resource coordinator with Public Allies. Brielle Petty is our Public Allies program manager. And Ashley Verdon, our outreach and engagement manager. We have some new faces who are, we, are, we are extremely excited to welcome to the INRC team. We would be remiss if we did not thank some incredible staff members who have given collectively over 15 years in support of INRC and have moved on to, to continue to do tremendous work with neighbors and neighborhoods. Um, Maury Planbeck uh, retired just about six weeks ago. And we wish him the very best. Vicki Rubio will be joining a national civic engagement organization, sharing her expertise and experience. And Ashley Weaver, who has joined United Way of Central Indiana. And we thank you all for your support. With that, I am going to turn it over to Brittany Redd, who is INRC's board president. Good evening, everyone. I'm excited to be here with you to share some of the exciting things that we've accomplished this year. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the members of our board who recently committed to serving another term of service at, um, all on the INRC Board of Directors, Gina Lewis Alexander, Daniel Bookheim, Valerie Davis, Joe Hausch, and Beth Reedman. Thank you so much for your renewed commitment and I'm looking forward to working alongside of you, alongside you a little bit more. Um, also, thank you to our outgoing board members for their service to the INRC. Uh, Jessica Castellanos, Ron Geyer, and Aaron McBride. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all your support um, of INRC and Indy Neighborhoods uh, during your time uh, with the Board of Directors. So I've been involved in INRC in various capacities for about seven or eight years. And during that time, I've had the privilege to witness how individuals are attracted to this organization because of its mission. It attracts um, passionate individuals who are mission-driven, who are dedicated to making our city the best city it could be. And it's been the same working alongside the great members of our board of directors. Um, I just wanna talk a little bit about a few things that we've accomplished um, over the course of this year. I'm kind of, um, blurring 2020 with 2021 because that has been COVID. <laughs> it's all a blur. Um, and I think the, the work that we started in um, some, of, some of it was pre-2020, but we really had to get the ball rolling in 2020 
and see um, and continue throughout 2021. So there'll be a little overlap. Um, I wanna start out with the strategic planning. Um, so this was um, a, a huge undertaking. This was hours and hours um, on Zoom, thinking critically about the impact that we wanna make on the city, um, looking internally about some of the challenges that we face as an organization, but as well um, the opportunities and what are we good at? Um, and ways to, to continue to do that good work, setting goals, um, strategizing around accomplishing those goals. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to implementing our strategic plan. We've already accomplished some good things that are a part of that plan. You can also check that out at the, uh, it's available for you to look at uh, on the INRC website. Also, we looked critically at our organizational structure. So, um, since its inception, INRC has been a membership-based organization, and as we were reviewing um, our, our, um, you know, our our strategy moving forward, we thought that a membership-based a membership-based structure wasn't the best for our community's needs. So we shifted away from that to now being op open for um, all of Indianapolis. Also, um, one of the things that we did um, back in 2019, we looked at our diversity and inclusion policy. It was time for that to be updated. Um, and during the course of reviewing um, that policy, we've decided that what we were talking about is becoming an anti-racist organization. We need to address um, racial equity in our city and the way that we can do that is looking internally, looking at what we do, setting an example, um, you know, making an impact by setting an example. So um, one of the things we did as far as uh, committing to becoming an anti-racist organization was establishing an anti-racist result state statement. So this is what we envision internally for our organization. That was a very important first step for us to make, but that was only the first step. We also, um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, we also um, worked to create an anti-racism priority list of priorities and how to achieve those priorities. So this ranged from looking at our programming, taking a critical look at the um, our programming, um, the way it's executed who we work with, how we work with communities, how we prioritize, um, also our internal operations, how do we work with each other, um, as far as like staff, board, um, vendors, and our funding model as well. So those are just a few things that were part of our anti-racism priorities, but that was a very important step to not just um, talking to talk, but actually creating a plan to becoming an anti-racist organization. Um, also, a, a part of that um, commitment was to look at our policies. What policies do, do we have uh, within our organization that may um, be at odds with that commitment to anti-racism? So we took, um, I, I think this was three months to review our policy documents including our HR handbook, bylaws, and various other documents to see um, how they can be improved to um, move towards dismantling race, racism within our organization. Um, so this is a lot. And again, we did this all during a pandemic and social and political unrest. So to my fellow board members, Thank you so much for your commitment to the organization, for your hard work, and then also allowing us grace. I know it was, uh, rest is important too. So we, we did a little bit of that as well. Um, and as we move forward, we acknowledge that this won't be easy. The things that I mentioned, the strategic plan, becoming an anti-racist organization um, is not an easy undertaking. This will be difficult, um, but rewarding. Um, so we decided to hire a consultant who has experience in both um, uh, change management and anti-racism work. So whatever it takes, um, consultant, 
Consulting will be helping us implement both our anti-racism priorities and our strategic plan. Uh, and we're in the middle of that right now. So they've been uh, holding focus groups, um, both internally and externally to help make that a reality. So those are just a few highlights, things that I'm, I'm excited to share with our Indy, our Indy family um, that's, that's been happening. Uh, so um, with that, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Deputy Mayor Judith Thomas. She is a community scholar of Africana Studies at IUPUI and previously served as president of the Madam Walker Legacy Center. Her role as Deputy Mayor of Neighborhood Engagement for the City of Indianapolis, um, Judith works closely with the Mayor's Neighborhood Advocates, the Citizens Police Complaint Office, the Office of Minority Women and Business Development, International and Latino Affairs, Veteran Services, and the Arts and Culture Community. Welcome, Judith. Thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate it. On behalf of the City of Indianapolis and Mayor Joe Hogsett, I'm excited to be here. Shirley Chisholm, the New York Congresswoman who made a presidential bid in 1972 is famous for having said, service is the rent we pay for the privilege of living on this earth. The wonderful volunteers and leaders being honored this evening are all about service, giving to their city, community, and neighborhoods. So first off, congratulations to you all. During my time as Deputy Mayor of Neighborhood Engagement, I have been amazed at the commitment residents have shown to making a difference. Their commitment gets me excited whenever I get to talk to community leaders and volunteers about their hopes and dreams for our city. So tonight I've been asked to focus on resilience and sustainability in our neighborhoods. And honestly, I could go on all night. People in every corner of Marion County have responded in force, not only to the challenges of the last 19 months, but to the chronic issues we face as a city, like access to food, education, and support services. Planner House, for instance, has served our community since 1898. For more than 120 years, they have been a West Side institution dedicated to promoting the social, moral, and physical welfare of African Americans. In 2021, they are as vital as ever. The food justice program at Flanner House has been transformative. In 2016, they opened a two acre farm growing healthy and affordable food. In 2019, Cleo's Bodega and Grocery provided more food security for the 46208 and the 46205 zip codes, which was previously one of our worst food deserts. Cleo's is also a gathering place for community, community to connect and share ideas and listen to music. And of course, the smoothies. I love the smoothies. Other resources they provide, the Center for Working Families, Elder Center, Job Readiness Summer Programming with Child Care Center, and of course, the Ujama, Ujami, Ujama Community Bookstore. We need more independent bookstores in our city. So after 120 years, Brandon Cosby and his team are working harder than ever to identify the needs of their community. Another great example of the kindness of grassroots neighborhood level work getting done, of the kind of grassroots neighborhood level getting work getting done is the Lawrence Community Gardens. I fell in love with the Lawrence Community Gardens when I first visited. Here, young people are planting and cultivating the land then they're selling what they produce. The farmer's market takes place in June through September at the 46th and Post Road area. Sharona Moore has poured her heart and soul into this farm and it shows. She is truly inspirational, especially for all the many other gardens in our city providing healthy options in food deserts. And then of course, there's a spire house located in the Riverside Park area they focus on community redevelopment, social justice, education, workforce development, and real estate. Sharon and Tim Clark are working to empower an entire neighborhood. Their Sunday supper events are now legendary, bringing neighbors and the community together for an old fashioned gathering while also providing a healthy meal and a welcoming atmosphere. 
United Northeast Community Development Corporation partnered with the Meadows Community Foundation to form the Alliance for Northeast Unification. With the leadership of CEO Ashley Gervitz, together they are laser focused on galvanizing the community on the Northeast side. So many organizations are doing great work on that side of town, like the Edna Martin Christian Center, Martindale Brightwood CDC, and the Avondale Meadows YMCA, still growing, str going strong with programming serving over 200,000 people. This year saw construction begin on a unique transformative partnership between Cook Medical and the community at 38th and Sheridan. The result will be a new manufacturing facility focused on hiring and training local residents for sustainable jobs. Added to that will be a locally owned Indy Fresh, Indy Fresh Market focused on healthy options, another grocery store that will address one of our food deserts. That facility will be located along the upcoming Purple Line, the construction of which we are all anxiously awaiting. Another good example of corporate and community partnership is Fifth Third Bank's Neighborhood Investment Program. Nine neighborhoods across the nation were selected, one of which was Arlington Woods. Here, a $20 million investment will be a part of a three-year collaboration with Eastern Star Church. These partnerships and collaborations are crucial to change. We must insist that corporations and organizations who are more eager than ever to collaborate with our neighborhood organizations, respect and listen to the residents. When they do, they will better understand the true needs and wants of those who live in the area. In times like these, we simply must promote and support each other. We have to keep telling those hopeful and inspiring stories of neighborhood resilience so that we can keep the faith and keep doing the transformative work we have all been looking forward to. Finally, for its part, the city enterprise is working hard to stay connected to the community and to neighborhoods. This week, we will announce the first of two Lift Indy neighborhoods, which for the second year includes a special focus on the places that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. Our mayor's neighborhood advocates continue to be resources to our neighborhood partners. Never hesitate to reach out to them. They are quite the resource. In the coming months, we will announce details about the neighborhood beautification and small projects micro grants. This program will focus on funding neighborhood driven projects created to beautify or strengthen community relationships. Any new idea or concepts along with existing projects and resources in need of funding will be considered. The city of Indianapolis is also committed to that living room of every neighborhood, our city parks. This past year, the Circle City Ford Initiative in its first phase will include $20 million in updates to Douglas Park, 11 million to Riverside Regional Park, and 7 million each to Craner and Grassy Creeks Park, Creek Park. Furthermore, with the American Rescue Plan investments announced earlier this month, our parks will also see $16.5 million invested into playgrounds and hardwoods, as well as $1 million in developing Wi-Fi at more parks. But we all know that it is the neighbors themselves who know our neighborhoods best. The organizations we honor tonight provide incredible resources to residents. Your work is transformative. We simply would not be the city that we are today without the leaders, staff, and volunteers of our neighborhood organizations. Clearly, there is much, much more work to be done. At times, it can be overwhelming, especially through years like 2020 and 21. But that's why events like this one are so important. We have to take time and appreciate all that we have accomplished, especially during this extra challenging time. As civil rights activist A. Philip Randolph said, a community is democratic only when the humblest and weakest person can enjoy the highest civil, economic, and social rights that the biggest and the most powerful possess. Thanks to the work of so many on this Zoom and in this room, you help make this the goal of our great city of Indianapolis. Thank you so much for having me and all the hard work that you do.
Thank you. Deputy Mayor Thomas, thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful leadership and strong advocacy, strong advocacy for Indianapolis and, and our the neighbors in our community. We appreciate you sharing your precious time. I'm sure you have plenty of assignments, plenty of other meetings to attend to this week from your incredibly uh, busy schedule to uh, join us for a few minutes this evening. Welcome everyone. My name is Ron Geyer and I serve as the chair of INRC's Resource Development and Marketing, Marketing Committee. Each year, it's this committee that gets to learn more about great activities going around in our, in our midst and to lift up some of the and present, make more visible some incredible work that is already happening here. INRC has been honor, honoring Collaborative Spirit awardees for the past 15 years. And it served as a way to recognize exceptional accomplishments by neighborhood associations and neighborhood-based organizations with a special focus on innovation, grassroots leadership, and great collaboration demonstrated by the awardee. This year's Collaborative Spirit Awardee, I think is really special. It is the Friends of Belmont Beach. Let me give you a little bit of background and then we'll see a presentation uh, that they put together about their initiative. In May of 2021, the Friends of Belmont Beach launched a pop-up park in Hawville along the banks of the White River. The land, which was once a segregated swimming hole for black residents who were not allowed to patronize city facilities. It, the area had become overrun with invasive plants and trash strewn about, making it a dangerous place. This neglect, if you will, overshadowed the true beauty of the land. But the Friends of Belmont Beach, basically a group of all volunteers, many of them from the neighborhood community, worked over the course of two years to help realize the hidden potential of the area. Since its launch, Belmont Beach has become home to monthly community gatherings like sound bath meditations, comedy shows, concert series on the river, a cultural festival, and the 10th anniversary celebration of reconnecting to our waterways, a real gathering place for the community. The group has engaged the Matchbook Schools, IPS 63, through a partnership with Arts for Learning, where students studied the history of the beach, performed spoken word, dance and created art pieces with repurposed materials to showcase what they've learned. As noted in their nomination form, this project was successful because it helped to amplify the community pride that is so prevalent in Hawville and neighbors were there right in the driver's seat. Now, I think this is a superb project. I think this is a project that has great legs, if you will. I think this can serve, this project can serve as a real beacon, an example for other communities and neighborhoods across the country, not just central Indiana. And so I think this is something that we should really applaud and promote. Well, now it's time for a video. I need to stop talking and watch pictures. So okay. here we go. Okay, let me get this shared just one second and share sound. You hear it? Awesome. I don't know why it stopped. It's Oh, it keeps pausing. Oh no.
Okay, let me um, try something else. Give me just one second. Use the technical difficulties. Ari, you know things don't run, run smooth when you want them to. <laughs> I know. I'm gonna I'm gonna get the video on YouTube, so hopefully that'll help us stream better. So I'm, I'm putting up their website. <laughs> Thanks, Gina. It's, okay. it's okay. You all hear it? The river has always been a part of life of the neighborhood. Now it's time that we get back to the river, you know, protect the river, you know, be more concerned about the river as opposed to it just being a, something we need to cross. It needs to be something that we actually need to engage with. You know, we can't have life without water. I think trying to uh, we, uh, uh, bring the river back to life in the Hallville near West Side community is very important because the river is not going into place and we can take advantage of the waterway and let it be attractive to uh, potential homeowners to come into the community's great and even businesses. And I think to try to bring it back to what it, not totally what it used to be because things have changed, but at least bring life back to the shores of the river is very important to help bring life into the, back into the community. So Belmont Beach and this project, this space is interesting because it's it's both special because its history is a segregated beach and its history in the Hobble community. And it's also very ordinary in the sense that uh, most of the spaces um, along the river are separated by uh, under-resourced communities and uh, primarily communities of color. And that's because the river was in such bad shape that uh, that space was left open for those communities to move into. So we have poorer communities and that separates more resource communities uh, in between the river. What got me involved in the program was just seeing, um, the first thing I thought was diversity. Um, the second thing I thought was just getting people together and being active at a, at a unique location. So professionally, for Visit the Energy, we're in the business of communicating stories of, you know, of experiences, of discovery, about bringing people together for a common experience. And I think um, there's more to that than just sitting in a convention center. Um, there's more to that than simply visiting Disneyland or, or having a fun time. It's about um, coming together of you know, people of diverse backgrounds, of diverse understandings, to have a shared experience. everyone for getting up this morning coming out and celebrating this park and i see it as a whole new beginning for hallville the next generation will unravel the dna of this here and now in a time capsule of x's and y's the ones who we said that we have been waiting for will have finally arrived i want to thank you on behalf of the city of indianapolis to all the neighborhood volunteers who helped plan and construct this park. I don't need to tell you, Hallville Pride is alive and it is well. Good to be out here. 100 years forward of timelessness, we will be able to say to our children that yes, yes, you were worth saving. So we decided to start with ourselves.
The stories of this site are, in some sense, a story of how, in our city's history, environmental degradation, racial and social injustices have too often been linked. You know, I really try not to think about the end of this project. I know that it was originally designed to be a temporary structure, um, but I don't like thinking about the end because I feel like what this actually is, beyond just being a project, beyond just being a temporary pop-up park, this is the beginning of something new. This is the beginning of a new era over here on the west side. They will excavate this experience in a hundred years for the timelessness in the laboratory of new life, and they will want to know how we made it happen. You were worth saving, so we decided to start with ourselves. Okay, ooh, anybody else get a little emotional? Let me stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you. That is so incredible. Thank you. Um, and congratulations again, friends of Belmont Beach. We are pleased to be able to work with you over the next couple of months and submit a nomination for your incredible work for a national award um, to the NUSA, Neighborhoods USA, for um, their gathering next May so that we can share your story across our entire country. Um, as we know, these last two years nearly, we've faced incredible challenges and unbelievable heartbreak. We've been asking ourselves, how can we and how can our communities be as strong and resilient as possible? We know that resilience is a process and it's something that we help grow over time. One of the first steps that we each can take is to connect with others so that we continue to feel a sense of belonging, a sense of place, and a sense of community. Just tonight, we heard an amazing, inspiring story of neighbors and neighborhoods coming together and supporting one another. At INRC, we work every day at bringing our vision statement closer to reality. Our vision includes that of resiliency, connected and supported neighborhoods, where neighborhoods are comprised of residents who know their neighbors. Relationships are open, authentic, and constructive. Neighborhoods are locally sustainable, diverse, and have a rich quality of life due, due to the collective gifts, talents, and dreams of all of the neighbors. And that neighbors know how to access all of the resources that we have in our city to create their own vision of a healthy neighborhood. So let's focus on how we can continue to cultivate sustainability within our own communities. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Please do keep an eye out for a newsletter that will detail more of what we talked about tonight of INRC's successes and accomplishments and plans for 2022 and ways that we want to continue to connect and lift up all of the work that's happening across our amazing city. Um, Again, thank you so much. And until then, we wish you good night. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Katira, appreciate you. Bye-bye. Thank you.